So I'm sitting down to do today's intro, and the reason why I'm sitting down to do today's intro is because my feet are killing me. I spent two days this last weekend walking Toronto Comic Con, and I did that because it's been a long time since I was at a big scale con, and well, I'm a, I'm a comic guy. I wanted to go and see comics. And I gotta tell you, the experience was somewhat eye-opening for me. It was eye-opening for me in a bunch of different aspects. And I think what we're gonna do today is we're going to go through the haul that came out of Toronto Comic Con. I'll show you guys the books, the comics, and the art that I bought. And then while I'm doing that, I'll walk you guys through the experience of what I was seeing while I was there. Because I'm pretty sure when you're starting to see some of the haul, you're gonna start asking questions, well, is that it? Yeah, you're probably gonna ask that question. I gotta tell you, yeah. Yeah, in certain aspects, that's it. Anyways, let's get into it. Okay, without any further ado, let's get into this thing. So, I told you guys that we were going to do this in three different stages. I'm going to show you books, then I'm going to show you comics, then I'm going to show you art. So, let's start with books. Now, I'd say one of the things I like about going to cons, and this is a big thing for me, is you get access to artists and comic artists that you wouldn't otherwise get access to. When you go to a comic shop, you buy the book, you take it home, you really are only dealing with the clerk, the owner maybe, and yourself. It's, it's a pretty lonely uh, field. But after you've read things and you get to enjoy things, you say to yourself, geez, you know, I really enjoyed this. I really like to meet that person. Or you know what, the next time I'm at a con, if that person's gonna be there, I should probably stop by and see them. Well, earlier this year, I found this book. Now, you're gonna look at this and you're gonna say, what the heck? Okay, Die Kitty Die. Uh, great story. It's it's done in sort of a, almost like a tongue-in-cheek type manner towards a, towards a Sabrina the Teenage Witch sort of thing by Dan Parent and Fernando Ruiz. Um, really good story. I've met Dan Parent before and had him do sketches uh, in my sketchbook. Uh, and I said after I bought this, you know what, I'm going to hold off on buying further issues now. I'm going to wait until it comes to the point where I can actually buy trade paperbacks of this and read them and enjoy them. Because one of the things I when I enjoy a story that I enjoy doing is actually reading the whole thing. This is the one thing that I actually criticize comics for is that they're too fragmented and it leaves you constantly on a cliffhanger where you've got to go buy the next one. And I understand why, it's to get you to buy more. So, with this in mind, I went to the Comic Con and I met Dan Parent. And when I met Dan Parent, he was selling these. These being the hardcover collections of the Die Kitty Die story, numbers one through four. Now, Quite happy with these, uh, in that they were reasonably priced. Uh, the art, and I'll flip through here and I'll show you guys, the art in these is really well done. You can see it almost has sort of like an Archie type look to it, uh, which is cool, but it's done with sort of more of an adult sense of humor to it, so there's more adult themes in it, there's more adult commentary in it, and, and really when they are looking back to that sort of pure, we'll call it the 1950s, 1960s style way of doing things, it's done in more of a tongue-in-cheek manner. So by getting these, you have the ability to read these, and it's, it's, it's just funny. And it's, as you're going through it, you're enjoying reading the funniness to it, but at the same time, you're getting a good visual picture while you're going. So when I bought all four of these, uh, Dan was nice enough to sign them for me, uh, which was great. In top of that, he signed my actual book, which I brought with me, which is the one I found out in the wild. And that's the first bundle of books I got. So I'll show you. You got the book number one there, which is Die Kitty Die. Uh, Die Kitty Die Hollywood. Okay. Uh, Die Kitty Die Heaven or Hell. And Die Kitty Die Starstruck. Very cool. And what I like more about this is the fact that you bought them from the artist himself. Uh, you get to say thanks for making it. You get to say I appreciate your work. And hopefully these artists actually enjoy getting that message. You know, if they don't, well, I'm giving it to them anyways, and at least it makes me feel good. So that's the first bundle of stuff we got there, and that was the Dan Parent stuff. The next bundle of stuff we got here, and this is another artist that I wanted to see while I was there. And I'm going to say this title, and you're going to say, what the heck? Pitiful Human Lizard. Uh, Jason Liu. So I'm going to show you Jason Liu, Pitiful Human Lizard. Bingo. This is completely a Toronto story. This is a story of a superhero that is superheroing in Toronto, and what I like. It's actually funny. The comment I was going to make is what I really like about this is that you get to see Toronto landmarks throughout this because Jason is a Torontonian. So when he's drawing this, he's drawing local Toronto street scenes. And he's drawing areas in Toronto that you would know. He's drawing streets you would know. Uh, it's got that typical, hell, I'll say it, it's got that typical Toronto attitude from a lot of the characters in here, which you would know if you're from Toronto. So this is book two. I already have book one. 
So book two collects the last bits of the Pitiful Human Lizard stories, and it actually puts them out in print where you can read them and say to yourself, yeah, that's pretty cool. And it collects the whole thing. The other thing it collects in here is a couple of the mini comics, because one of the things that Jason Liu was doing is when he was putting these out and doing these particular comics, he was going to shows and printing mini comics that he would give away or you could buy. Well, you're not going to find them anywhere now. So in these hard, or sorry, these collections, not hardcovers, this is paperback, you actually get the mini comics in the back. So uh, to some people that might not be so important. To me, that's pretty important. This is a title that actually triggered with me. I was like, yeah, it's got a lot of Toronto in it. So I immediately beelined my way to uh, Jason Liu's booth and I made sure I picked up this one. The, he's actually moved on from the Pitiful Human Lizard. Uh, my understanding is this is the new series he's working on called The All Nighter. I haven't read any of this yet. Uh, but I knew that he was going to have paperbacks or trade paperbacks of it, so I made sure that I was picking this up while I was there. While I was there picking these up, he, uh, I believe, he signed them, which is cool. Uh, this one even put a little face in, which is nice. Uh, but the other thing that he did for me is he said, oh, because I was talking about the Pitiful Human Lizard, and I actually mentioned to him that I have an original art page that I bought from him at a con years ago, framed in my basement and that he had done a commission in my sketchbook. Uh, so what he did was he threw in a bunch of the Pitiful Human Lizard issues that he also had there at the table um, to go with it, which was great. Now, listen, these are not going to be multi-million dollar collectible, hey, look at the books I've got. Uh, but to me, they mean something. And again, I bought these books knowing that these books and the contents would mean something to me. So I'm quite happy with those. Those are the book hauls that we got from Toronto Comic Con put this over here with the rest of the pile. Now, comic book wise. So you just saw that Dan Parent book over there that was nicely put away, uh, that had a signature on it. I took that to the con and brought that home from the con. That was something I took with me. So comic haul from the con. That's it. That's the haul from the con. Now you're gonna look at this and you're gonna say, Jim Balance Tarot, Witch of the Black Rose. Trust me, if you know what this title is, uh, Jim Balance, Witch of the Tarot, uh, you know what it is. If you don't know what it is, you don't know what it is. It's that simple. You're probably not going to know what it is. Jim Balance is a guy who did like early 1990s Catwoman comics. Uh, it's really where he cut his teeth and got really well known as an artist. Uh, mostly because of his, well, let's call it the appreciation of the female form. So he headed off from that. I don't know exactly what the history of this is, but he moved into this, which is almost a self-published work through Broadsword Comics. And you can order these at your comic shop. It's still going on. I believe they're up to issue 133 now or something, 22 years in. So you can still buy them, but you don't really see them out in the market that often. So you'll say to me, Tennessee Fats, did you specifically go hunting this book? No, I did not. I specifically went hunting six different comic books. Comic books which ranged from fairly expensive, at least as far as I'm concerned, to fairly cheap. Uh, I went from $2 all the way up to like a $450, $500 book. Well, Walking the Con, uh, books that I would see as being anywhere from, oh, I don't know, maybe $100, maybe two at the most, were listed at $600, $700. Uh, books that are $400 $500, I saw the cheapest one listed at $1,000, the most expensive one listed at $1,600. And I don't know what's really going on with comic pricing. It's, it's that simple. I, I wish I could give you guys an honest answer and say, you know what, this whole thing is going to explode. Uh, the whole market's going to collapse. Or, you know what, these prices are great. Go out and buy it right now. I wish I knew. If I did know, I'd already be rich because I already would have made a million by myself. But I don't know. What I do know is when I have all these sources of information at home, uh, online, and in a variety of other different places, telling me that the book is a, let's call it a $200 book, I don't see why I should be paying $450 for that book just because I'm at Toronto Comic Con. That does not make sense. Uh, worst example I actually had was uh, I was walking up to one booth and I saw they had the first appearance of Mordred the Mystic. This is a Marvel book. And I think this is pure Marvel media, movie hype and speculation. This is a Bronze Age book. It's not worth that much cash. I believe I picked up my copy about a year and a half ago out of a $2 bin at my local comic shop just because I was buying Bronze Age books at that time, saying, you know what, I'm just going to pick up a couple of these because they're fun to read. So when I saw it on the wall, I asked, well, how much is that book? They had three copies. The cheapest was $275. The most expensive was, I believe, $425. 
Uh, and the condition of my $2 book at home was better than all three of those copies. I don't know what to make of pricing, but I do know if you don't understand pricing, you don't play in that market. So when I went hunting, because I had art being done, so which we'll get to next, uh, I said, I'm just going to go dar start digging through bins. I actually found this. And this means something to me, and you'll see why this means something to me in a subsequent video, uh, where we do an opening of an order actually directly from Broadsword Comics. We'll save that for later. This is a nice segue into that, but this is the one book I bought, and I can tell you this book was 10 bucks. And I may have overpaid for this, but because I don't ever see it anywhere, I bought it, and that was my comic call. So if when I, earlier on in the intro where I said, if you're going to say, hey, is that it? Well, yeah, that's it, as far as raw books go. Okay, now comes the fun part. Let's get into the art now. Now to do this, I'm going to do two things. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom you in. Uh, we're going to move the camera. So I'm going to cut film now, and we're going to cut back in. And we're back. Okay, we move things around a fair amount here. And what you've zoomed in on here is the Tennessee Fats Traveling Sketchbook. Uh, I think the title says it itself. It's my traveling sketchbook. Thumbs up. So let's get into this. So earlier on, you know, I showed you those books that were done, uh, Die Kitty Die, that were done by Fernando Ruiz and Dan Parent. Well, guess what? The first two people to do sketches in my sketchbook were Fernando Ruiz and Dan Parent. Very cool. I have a bunch of other stuff in here too, but that's not what we're going to talk about today. Today what we're going to do is we're going to zoom right in on what we got at this particular con. Because I did get a couple sketches done here. So I'm going to go boom. There we go. First thing you're seeing here, this is done by Tom Grunt. Uh, a very well-known artist that does, well, I did a lot of work in the 90s on a lot of Superman titles that I know, uh, as well as a bunch of other titles. He did DC work, I believe he did Marvel work as well. But when I was there, I says to myself, self, if you're going to get something done by Tom Grumman, what would you get? Well, I got the 1990s Superboy. And it was funny, when I was asking the draw, this, and they were, I was saying, I'd like you to do a Superboy. And he said, well, which Superboy? And I was like, well, the 90s Superboy. And his response was, the only Superboy that matters. And I was like, yes, absolutely. There you go. So it's a pencil sketch. It's got a nice blue background to it. Took a while to get done, but you know what? He had a bunch of other things sitting in front of me in his queue. Uh, so I totally understand. And I'm quite happy with how this turned out. And I'm glad to have it as an addition into the book. The next piece of art that we got in here was the following day. Now, you might recognize this, this signature. You might not. This is uh, Mike Ruth, uh, the guy who does a lot of cover art and has done some great work with Swamp Thing. For anybody who has seen a bunch of my Instagram posts, you know I'm really fond of Swamp Thing. Uh, so when I heard he was going to be there, I was like, yeah, we got to get that done. And I'll tell you, he's a stand-up guy to meet, too. I tell you, I, I wanted to get this done on the Friday, but uh, my schedule just wasn't working for it. And I had to come back to him late in the day on Friday and say, listen, is there any way you can switch this to Saturday morning? And without complaining or anything, he immediately swapped me over to Saturday morning so I can get this done, which I think was a really stand-up move. I'm quite happy with it. I think he just killed this character. Just killed it. I was like, wow. And the detail is phenomenal. So, and for any of you who are interested, I would also encourage you to go and check out his Instagram channel, uh, where I saw a small video of him doing art with a fishbone he found, which was really, really cool. Now, this is going to take us to what was going to be the last one of the show, but turned out to be two for me. And this is done by Leonard Kirk. Now, Leonard Kirk, some of you are going to know uh, from his run on Supergirl. Uh, many of you are going to know him. He's currently working on Sabretooth for Marvel Comics. And I don't know how he did it, and I don't know how he fumbled our way into this, but I ended up with a twofer deal here, uh, where I got uh, two sketches done by him uh, at the same time on the same day. The first one being this Wolverine, which I think is just stunning. Um, really, what more could I say? The detail is just phenomenal. But the other one here, which came in on the back side of this, was Supergirl. Uh, because he had a long run on a Supergirl series, which I thought was really good. And I like the cleanness to this one. I, I, I don't get me wrong, I'm not dissuading anything on this. This is clearly a Wolverine picture, and it fits perfectly with that character. But this fits more with just the cleanness of just, just Supergirl to me. And I thought this was a nice one to get in. So that's what we got in the Traveling Sketchbook. So I'll close that back up. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to flip over to some other stuff. So we're going to pause this again. I'm going to move the camera again. We're getting into two other things. Hold on now. Okay, and we're back. Well, I'm not going to waste any time. Let's just put this out here. Boom. Now, I don't normally buy 
blank sketch covers. Uh, the reason why is, well, I just normally don't carry them around at cons to get them done. I had this sitting in my collection for a while. I didn't really know what to do with it, honestly. Uh, then I heard that Greg Highland was going to be at the show. Now, for any of you who know, or who don't, uh, Greg Highland is a local Canadian artist and a bit of a cult following. Uh, the bit of the cult following comes from a variety of sources. Mainly it's because of his lethargic comics that he did way back in the 90s. Uh, he's been doing that for quite some time. He's also done a lot of Lego comics, uh, and he's done really well with that. But on top of all of that, right now he's doing online comics, which are supported through Patreon, which is, uh, which is the Frog Crisis, which is right here. So when I heard he was going to be there, and as I was looking at this cover, I thought to myself, you know, let's combine all of some of my favorite, well, all of, a lot of my favorite things from the 90s in my youth and put them all into one thing. So I like Lego, okay, so we'll get a Lego drawing in. I like Solar Man of the Atom because I like the Valiant comics, and I like the, the fact that it was relaunched on Dynamite, sure. And I like my Frog Crisis because this is sort of a throwback to my lethargic comics. Let's get this done. This was the first sketch I, th I got done at the con. This was the first booth I stopped at when I got there. This is the first place I walked to, and damn, that is just awesome. Very cool. So I'll set this over here for now. Now the next one, uh, that's a bit of an art that's comic book sized. And I don't count this really, and by the way, that's not a comic book purchase. That's from my own collection I took in. This one I count as art. And the reason why I count this one as art is because there's two things that come with this. Let's just put this out here first. All right, we'll start with that. So R.B. White uh, is a vampire, well, he's, he's done a lot of artists. I can't just say he's a vampire artist. He's done a lot of things. But I like his Vampirella work that I've seen. And one of the, I wanted to find him at the con, and I wanted to get a sketch done by him. But unfortunately, and this is my own stupidity, I just simply could not find his booth. And I only found it when it was too late. I was pretty much done for the day. I was heading out, and suddenly I'm walking by, and I said, oh my god, there's R.B. White and his stuff. So while I was there, and I was talking to him, and I was saying, well, what's the next con you're going to be at? And maybe I'll you know, get a commission done in my book. He mentioned, well, I do have some sketches here. So saw this and what I like about this is it has that markup up on the corner of just the face it's uh, just that one little touch up right there just the face that to me I was like yeah yeah I'm gonna take that I, I don't need to think twice on that I'm gonna take that home and I'm gonna give it a good home very happy with that but since he saw that I was interested in sketches he went digging through his stuff and he found this for me as well which is a red line pencil sketch of just Vampirella. Uh, and I was like, yeah, I'm not going to think twice on that. I will totally take that home and I will give it home. And he signed it for me before we left. So that's another piece of art that came with it. Now what I'm going to do with this is I'll put it in my folio uh, and I'll keep it in there uh, going forward. I'll rebag and board these two comics up here because I want them put in a proper place where they're safe. But that is some pretty cool art before we get to the folio. Speaking of the folio, Let's move the camera and get to that. Okay, now when I say folio, I mean folio. I went out and picked this up because years back I picked up a bunch of art pages from Adam Archer. Uh, for those of you who are curious about Adam Archer, you should be. Check him out. He's got a couple books out there that are on Amazon of his original art. And on top of that, he does a lot of really cool uh, digital art, uh, digital books that you can pick up. So I picked this up because I started keeping the pages in there. But let's take a look at what we got at this particular show because that's what we're really talking about today. So let's get back to the right pages. Can we get there? We can get there, here we go. All right, so we'll start off with this one. This is the Leonard Kirk page that I got. And you'll see I have a book right here as well. Why do you have the book, Tennessee Fats? Well, I'll tell you why. When I was going through the pages with Leonard when I was at the site, uh, I saw this one and this one sort of, well, that's what it called out to me. The reason why it called out to me is because what I like is for any of you who don't know, uh, Sabretooth is kind of, well, he's one of my top characters that I enjoy in Marvel. And what I liked is that you had him right here. But on top of that, the other thing that I liked was you had an image that had Professor X and Magneto sitting right here, all on one page. So I was like, yeah, I'll pick that up. Now, I hadn't really been reading a lot of new comics. It's, it's not really my thing. Uh, so I hadn't really kept up on a lot of stuff. So to me, I was thinking, okay, well, it's pretty cool Sabretooth, but well, when is Sabretooth coming up? Well, I went back and did some digging. This is the current issue in the store, right now. And there's the page. There's the art. Page, art. Page, art. 
that is just awesome. And, and what I like in this is it's the blue line pencil on it. And it's not digital, it's done by hand. You can see everything that's happened as this page has been developed along the way to get to the ink point before they get to obviously the coloring and the proofing and everything else. Very cool, very cool indeed. So yes, that is why the comic is in there. Let's put that away here. And then we'll jump over to the next one. Obviously I'm not too, too concerned about the condition of that particular comic. To me, I just bought that because I said, well, I want to keep that handy so that I can always compare the page with the book. And I actually saw R.B. White doing this at his booth where he had the original pages for his Vampirella covers with the other material. So there's two pages here. So let's start with the first one. Right off the bat, there's Dan Parent. And he had a couple pages there. One that was particularly interesting, I was really tempted by, was he had a picture of Veronica and she was having it with Mr. Lodge, her dad. And I thought, ooh, that, that is a good one there because I... Well, Mr. Lodge, I think, is quite funny. So I was like, eh, do I get that one? The other one that I saw at his booth that I was particularly tempted by was the uh, Superman Meets Batman 1966 page that was at the front of the portfolio. But I said, mm. this one jumped at me, though, because this is a page from Die, Kitty, Die. I saw this, and I recognized, especially with the stars and the glitter up there, I said, wait a minute, that's Die, Kitty, Die. And I just bought the book of Die, Kitty, Die. So there's the page with all the wording. All right, and there's the original pencils. Pretty fantastic. He signed that one for me while I was there. That was that was pretty cool. That's that's a pretty cool art page. Quite happy with that. Okay, last page that I picked up, and this one speaks to me a lot. Uh, it comes from Adventures of Superman number five sixty. This is from Tom Grummet, and I'm just taking the book out because guess what? I got the book for this too. Close that up. Look at that. Just look at that. There's Jor-El. There's Cal, Lois. And what I loved in this was the background silhouette on Jor-El. The fact that you had a panel or a page that I could buy that had Superman, the Superman from the 90s, the Superman that I identify with, with his father, Jor-El, on the same page. That, to me, was pretty tough. was, ooh, that's pretty good. It's funny, they had another page there that was um, around the same time period, but it was from an action comics, and Superman had hurt his arm. And I was a toss-up between the two. The only reason I was at a toss-up was because, well, this one fades off for effect. You lose the imaging or whatever picture would be here. It's gone. It's, well, it's not gone. It was never there. Uh, the other one was a full page of art, and I was like, oh, but this one, because of the Jor-El, it's like, yeah, I'll get that. So as soon as I got back home, I ran over to the LCS and went through the $2 bins and do, 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 do. what did I find? But the actual page. So you can see there, there's the color version where you can see that cosmic sort of pattern sitting on the, the, the head up here. You can see there's, there's Jor-El and there's Superman fading away into the emptiness at the end and there's the original inked page. That's pretty, pretty fantastic. I'd say I haven't really been getting into a lot of buying comic pages. I've been doing mostly sketches, but uh, now that I've sort of found a couple and from artists that I really like, I'm probably gonna start going down this road a little bit more and building out this folio a bit more because these are just awesome things to have. Yeah. So everybody, that's that's the haul for the Comic Con, uh, for the Toronto Comic Con, and what came out of it. And I know um, many of you are going to be saying, "Well, Rob, it's Toronto Comic Con. Why didn't you buy comics?" Uh, well, as I mentioned, there was a price issue there, and when you don't understand the price, you don't spend the money. Anyways, I hope you all enjoyed that one. Everybody, I will see you in the next video. And for those of you who are sticking around because you wanted to see the extra nerdy hint that I gave you would be at the end of the video, well, after the uh, fade out to black here, enjoy that. Okay, as promised, I promised some extra nerdy stuff at the end of the video, and here's what it is. Can you see it? Can you actually see what that is? These are Tron cards and stickers from the original movie that are what 1981 yeah 1981 down there 
So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna open these up. I've never bought these old packages and we'll tried to open them before. Uh, oh, and by the way, I also have an Incredible Hulk package from the 1990s as well. So let's see what we got on these things. And, and uh, well, let's see what we got, let's put it that way. I have no idea what's gonna be in these. I do remember buying 1990s non-sports card packages back in the day. I used to get the Marvel cards, uh, the X-Men, X-Men, I bought X-Men cards. Uh, I remember there being Ghost Rider cards. I don't remember there being Hulk cards. So let's see what's inside a Hulk pack, shall we? Mm-hmm. Okay, so I've got a picture of the Hulk fighting Thor. Oh, I got a picture from the uh, the what is it? The Eric Bana or Eric Bana uh, film. Very cool. I guess this is what these are all from. They're from the Eric Bana film. There's again Eric Bana film. Very neat. Oh, the leader. He's, he's the leader. He's got a giant head. Uh, the next generation in superhero, super-powered trading card games coming soon. What is this? Win an original 1962 Hulk number one comic book. Well, I guess it's probably a little too late for me to be entering that contest. And there is a Hulk famous covers. Famous Hulk covers. Hmm. So that's what you got in that pack. I gotta tell you. I'm gonna use that. That's one piece of junk, two, three, four, five. Now, this thing was supposed to have, this is supposed to have five trading cards per pack. Okay, well, there you go. So that is what indeed what it had. Good on me. All right, back to the Tron stuff. This is the one that I was particularly excited about. I wonder what was inside these. What? So this says it's going to have eight cards and one sticker. Ooh, feel that waxy package. Waxy package. What do we got here? The master control card. Oh, that's the sticker. Howdy Tron. Oh, that's one of those gate things that crushes people. Wow, these images are phenomenally sparse. Uh huh. And that, I believe, is a ship. Ooh, there you go. Blue face. Classic. Uh, ooh, more people in crazy styling. And the track. And the pod exit the carrier. Oh. Huh. Wow. Are these all going to be like blue opaque pieces of cardboard is it with really limited images stuck right in the middle? I wonder if this was like avant-garde for 1981. I remember the movie. I do remember the movie. I don't remember these cards at all. Ooh, ooh, there you go. That's pretty classic. Oh, and the, and the back has, I'm guessing, what is a piece of a larger puzzle. Uh, oh, racing cycles. Very neat. Oh, she looks happy. Good on her. Oh, more racing cycles. Why didn't we get any racing cycles in the first pack? Oh. Oh, oh, oh. Is that him entering when he just gets there? I think it is. A gate thing again. Oh, somebody's driving a motorcycle. And somebody's being chased in his car. These all have... Yeah, they do. They all have these... So these all go towards one large image that you'd have to build in the back. Huh. Oh, this one's already open. You know, that means that somebody's already gone through this pack. Tisk, tisk, tisk. Tisk, tisk, guys. Ooh, blue guy. A lot of glare off that green cycle. Lots of glare. And the cycle race, which was the highlight of the movie, really. Kind of funny. The miscutting. You see how it's so far over here versus that. Oh, designing the cycle. What do we got over here? Oh, I already have this one. Oh, I already have this one. Wow, I have three packages. I have repeats. Cycles again, out there causing trouble. And again, there she is looking happy. I already have that one too. Ooh, a Tron sticker. That's pretty awesome. Can't argue with that. Well, I must say, that was phenomenally boring. I don't think I'm going to buy cards again. Neat, but eh. I'll stick to comics. 